This is the football pod where we discuss anything and everything football. My name is Konstantin Eckner. My co-host is Abel Mesarosch. Abel, I know we are of the belief that we can never have too much football going on. But maybe we are getting to the point where it is just too much. The FIFA wants to host the World Cup every two instead of every four years. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think the initial reaction is like a lot of people is, is why? Like, why wouldn't we just have it every four years like we usually do? But then I think, you know, some people argue that uh, maybe we could we can have more, right? Like more is always better, right? And then I think that's essentially the question we want to discuss today with somebody who is much better qualified than, than we are. And it's uh, Tari Panja, who um, covers football on a global level and particularly things like FIFA and international politics and football and how they intertwine for the New York Times. So we hope you enjoy our discussion with Tariq Panja from the New York Times. Tariq, it's great to have you on. Thanks for your time. Uh, it's great to, to join you guys. Thanks for the invitation. So as a lot of listeners know, you are often reporting about what I would call the dark sides of football. Uh, and given what you know about the business of football, are you personally even interested in watching the matches anymore? <laughs> That's a good question. Look, uh, yeah, I think um, the sport itself, when you watch watch a game, there was uh, Man City, Liverpool on, on Sunday, the day before we record this podcast. Second half was one of the best um, 45 minutes of football I've seen in a long time. Quite quite exciting, um, you know, and, and that is what moves people's emotions. And you, you still you still get a thrill, uh, I guess, from the game. But yeah, you know, perhaps to your wider point, maybe maybe not as much as I did in the past. Right. I mean, the Sunday, the day before we are recording this show, um, was kind of you know. A, good example or a perfect example of what football can be in today's world. I mean, on the one hand, we had a couple of exciting matches across Europe, for instance. Um, as you said, Liverpool, Man City. We also had the Super Clasico in, in Buenos Aires, you know, also, in my opinion, at least, a great match in terms of like the atmosphere, at least. Uh, we had a couple of great matches in, in Germany, you know, Bayern Munich lost uh, and so on. Like the football itself is, is enjoyable. But on the other hand, like we, the Pandora Papers dropped. Um, and new revelations about what I just called, I don't know, dark sides of football, whatever you want to call it, but, you know, the, the darker sides of uh, the business as a whole um, were also revealed. And so you can really see the range of what football makes today. It's entertainment on the field, be it in the first, first few divisions or even on the amateur level, I still think there's a lot of entertainment in it. But on the other hand, we have a lot of things going on these days that are concerning to say the least um and you are as a reporter for the new york times you have been on top of uh, many of these topics um and i especially wanted to have you on because you have done a lot of reporting on fifa um on you know on all the federations but especially fifa um i think you and martin siegler from the times you you guys are really leading the charge there uh, when it comes to reports on on fifa and what's going on uh within the class and uh, stone walls of, of the FIFA headquarters. And that's also <laughs> a re recently uh, a recent topic that had come up that maybe they will actually move there. But that's a different, uh, different topic for a different time. Um, I wanted to talk or we wanted to talk to you about, first of all, the World Cup and the plans uh, by Gianni Infantino and the FIFA to have a biannual, bi-yearly World Cup. Um, Maybe, you know, because you're more or less the expert or you are the expert, uh, could you give us like what's the situation right now in terms of, um, you know, a, a schedule change with the World Cup? Yeah, so uh, as, as most of the people listening to this podcast will know, the World Cup is an extremely popular event, very basic thing to say, but that generates almost the entirety of FIFA's income, uh, more than 90%, 67 billion at the moment, and that will probably increase um, as, as, as time moves on. This, this money is, is what FIFA uses essentially to develop the game around the world. So Gianni Infantino's idea is, well, hang on, we have this very popular product. Why don't we do it every two years? And um, he suddenly, and 
brought it to the table and it's moving at such a pace that this could be decided by the end of this year, which is much to the consternation and, and fury, I would say, of other actors in, in the football spaces and leagues, particularly in Europe and clubs in Europe, UEFA, for example, the European football's governing body, saying, hang on, we have not had a proper debate on this. We haven't had much of a say. Why are we doing this? FIFA would say, well, our job is to develop the game in the, wor in, in the world, not just in Europe. They, they are frustrated at the lack of growth um, and improvement in football in, in places outside of Europe, particularly, say, in Africa, um, you know, parts of Asia. It's still very dominant, dominated by um, European and South American nations on a, on a World Cup level. And they're using Arsene Wenger, the former Arsenal coach, as the, 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 to spearhead this charge. He's, a, he's a now an official of FIFA, and these are all his ideas. Um, and this, this forms part of a wider and very important conversation of what football will look like in the future. There is a um, major moment coming up in the next year as well at the same time, which is, it's very, it sounds very boring. Uh, it is about the international match calendar, IMC. And this is what sets the kind of fixture list, if you want, when matches will be played from a domestic level and international level for the next 10 years. But, you know, everyone, including FIFA, is trying to uh, grab space in this calendar. New tournaments, new events, um, and, and this is where we are right now. Yeah, so just to jump in here, Tariq, I, I wanted to, like, I think the initial reaction for most people, and this is something that I feel like has been a cycle um, that, you know, we always go through now is whenever there's some sort of new change to to football, there's a lot of sort of reactionary um, treatment of it by fans that oh this is why why are we changing it right and then usually it's almost like the the seven stages of grief that they that they will somehow accept it right like um, you know I understand how led by Wenger and FIFA supposedly polled um, 20 23,000 people and uh, unsurprisingly they came out in favor of these changes well you know uh, some good 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 polling there but um, do you feel like that 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 the the newsworthy part of it is is just how rapidly this story is developing, uh, or my other question is why is it developing now? In other words, like what has changed so that you know FIFA has realized? I mean, presumably they've always known uh, they, they've been they they can make more money, right? But what is it about well, the I, I don't know if they can actually make as much money as as people think. This idea that if if you have the World Cup every four years instead of every two years, it will just double because that's what people want. There is a, a finite amount of money and interest yeah. in the world as well for these things. I guess what makes the World Cup so valuable in a way is its rarity. You can't, you know, you can't go to a, you know, if you go to a buffet and you keep eating, in the end, you'd you be sick of the food that you're served. And t to be honest, there is too much, I would argue there's almost too much football. Um, available to, to everybody right now, maybe you know because of um, cable TV and, and an expansion of Champions League events and you know Nations League competitions and other etc etc. I'm talking from a European perspective because we, we're, we're based here um, and we're talking about this. But you know you, you then overlay this with the World Cup. Is it necessarily going to be the huge cash cow? Uh, that FIFA is anticipating. I, I'm not quite so sure. Is a demand for that there? Again, I, I, I'm, I'm not so sure. Well, then the question is about process. Is this the way how FIFA have gone about it, almost like a reverse engineering way? They have an outcome that they'd like, and now they're having a consultation process that is taking them on the way um, uh, to, to achieving that goal. And also, this speaks maybe to the fact the structures of football, are they fit for purpose in the 21st century? Should all the decisions, major decisions that affect um, the game as an economic activity and a sort of socially important um, pastime for billions of people around the world be decided by 211 national football associations? Are these people fit for purpose? 
um, you know, should, you know, just for an example, and again, I hold no, um, you know, uh, position either way, really, but just to ask a question, you know, is it, is it important that Bangladesh, uh, is it correct, sorry, that Bangladesh have more say over the way football is run than, say, Borussia Dortmund or Bayern Munich? Again, I don't know, because Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund will have no say. And I just use these two clubs because Constantinus called me from, from Germany. Um, they, they are big actors in the world of football, yet they have no real say in, in, in the way in which the game will be organised. Maybe we need to talk about this um, more. And as far as this process goes, if it's something that fundamental, why is it going at such a rapid speed in order to get this done? One of the answers is the identity of the man who is the FIFA president, Gianni Infantino. He has, seems to have been in a hurry ever since he got elected in 2016 to do something, to do anything. And he keeps throwing these things at the wall and just hurtling at 100 miles an hour in order to get something done, a kind of a quest for a legacy. Um, this is me projecting. I don't speak to him particularly often. He, he doesn't do that much media anymore, certainly not with um, Western outlets. That might be a bit more critical of 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 his uh, posture. But but again, process is a problem for me. I mean, you're raising an interesting point uh, in general when it comes to FIFA and the structures, because what we or what what we see right now with the World Cup, for instance, is that um, a rift between the UEFA, Euro the European nations, most of them, um, the South American nations, so the, the leading football nations still when it comes to just competitiveness. Um, and on the other hand, Africa, Asia, especially Africa, where Gianni Infantino is presenting himself as the voice, the main supporter of African football, um, you know, just recently has again talked about the African Super League um, to s support financially the African clubs, the top clubs more than they are now. So they are supported right now. So um, there is a rift within FIFA, and I don't really see any way to, you know, I don't know to heal there um, or to bring healing. So, but that really brings the brings up the question: like, what's the future when really Europe and South Africa, South America against um, Asia and and Africa? Essentially, you know, it's a little bit it's a little bit more difficult and a little more complex than that. But it looks like that. So, I mean, if there really is a rift within FIFA, then I mean, the worst case would be, or maybe it's not the worst case, but a uh, probable case would be that the entire FIFA collapses in a way. Yeah, that, that that is you know an important conversation because uh, talking to people inside FIFA, they 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 believe some of them believe they're in a um, a kind of uh, a competitive war with UEFA for um, supremacy, but UEFA sits inside FIFA, and they will say, "What in what other situation will you have a competitor who can sit on your board and have a say in your decision making?" Okay. Uh, on the other hand. You can see what FIFA wants to do by what it's done in Africa. I don't believe in any meaningful way the Confederation of African Football exists as an independent organization anymore. I believe in the last year, year and a half, it has been subsumed almost entirely by FIFA, and it is a subsidiary of Zurich FIFA. Um, FIFA, there was a crisis there for a long time, but FIFA essentially took over in 2019 on an emergency basis. There is a new president now, uh, Patrice Motsepe, a billionaire from South Africa, but he was Gianni's man. Um, and FIFA have managed to wield so much power over the national associations in Africa that not a single word of opposition will now be heard about anything FIFA proposes, because it's FIFA that holds all the purse strings, controls the money that these national FAs get. So FIFA is in control of African football. That is very clear. Now, if FIFA could do the same for all the other um, five confederations, I'm sure it would. Because, I, you know, I did, really, I don't think FIFA wants these confederations to exist. And if you're going to design maybe 
football, how it's organised today. Some people will argue, do you need all these different confederations? Some would say, no. On the other hand, the risk FIFA is, <laughs> is running here with the biennial World Cup is, look, if, the, if it goes to a vote tomorrow, you need a two-thirds majority. I think FIFA probably has the numbers because UEFA and Europe and South America are a very small amount of the, you know, um, 211 FIFA members. And if they lose, and we've heard um, Alexander Sheffer in the UEFA president say, they and South America would boycott um, a FIFA tournament. Okay, now then you follow a line of reasoning. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but it's good for a conversation. Yeah. You, 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 you have a boycott, and you then have the European nations and the South American nations, and by that we mean primarily Brazil and Argentina. If they say, we will have our own tournament, and we don't want to participate in the World Cup. Um, and then potentially say to any other country in the world, you're more than welcome to play in our football tournament. The, 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 the situation for FIFA or the, is, is critical. Then it, you know, it doesn't have a tournament without these, these nations. And I think this, this is almost like a, feels like a, a zero sum game that these guys are playing here, a, a, a race to extinction for, for someone. Um, and you overlay it with all the other conversation we had, we've had about Super Leagues and global, global Club World Cups and all of this. It seems to me like we are heading for some serious fundamental changes. And maybe legislation at a European level um, to control the, these organizations, be it FIFA or UEFA, to make sure they act as fair, fair, fair and correct actors in, in governing and running world football. Yeah, to just add a few background informations for our listeners um, uh, on what you just said. I mean, one thing is uh, Gianni Infantino in, yeah, is pretty close, as you said, uh, with uh, the CAF president Patrice Motseba of South Africa. And now there's also there are reports out that um, the Club World Cup it might be moved it will probably be moved away from japan where it is usually hosted uh, and it might be moved to south africa um the country where patrice mozeba is from and also the uefa and the south american federation the Con conmebol uh, they are have been cooperating for quite some time now um, they are also planning to open a joint office in london um, and they are also they have scheduled a match between the Europe champions Italy and the Copa American champions uh, Copa America champions Argentina for summer 2022, and that's a game that should or is expected to become a regular thing. Like you know the European champion and the Copa America champion a meeting for uh, I don't know what you want to call it, but you know <laughs> it's not a substitute World Cup, but it's kind of like the you know the big giants, the two giants of the two continents are, are meeting. Uh, to figure out uh, who's the best team at this point. So um, there are some developments uh, going on uh, in the background. Maybe not, you know, not all the people, all people are aware of it, but it's, I think it's good to, to at least uh, bring it up. Now, back to what you just said uh, about, and that's something that I have on my mind a lot. Um, you know, when I read about FIFA, even UEFA, I think in a, in a weird way of coincidence uh, due to the Super League, due to now the World Cup plans, the UEFA has uh, this year um, uncharacteristically uh, looked like the good guys. Um, you know, because they have opposed some of these plans and uh, UEFA are by no means the good guys, um, let's be honest. Still, um, I, when I look at FIFA and UEFA and other federations, I sometimes think like that. It's still like, it feels like the Wild West. Yeah, not just in terms of like what, what kind of tax exemptions and so on, but it's also, it just feels in general like the Wild West. They can almost do whatever they want. Um, but uh, what you just brought up that like maybe they are, regulators um you know legislators who are then stepping in and and trying to do something about it i think the, the big the biggest issue is that like you might be able to do it within the realms of the european union but on a global scale it wouldn't be possible and i think that's why i still feel like there's there might be a collision happening uh with the fifa you know breaking into two or three parts 
Yeah, no, that's exactly perhaps what should happen, um, because if you if you kind of spool back, move away, move the lens back a little bit, we have to talk about what the functions of FIFA and and the regional bodies, if you like, are. So on one on one level, they are. Um, uh, an economic actor, they're an event organizing company. In FIFA's case, it is the the organizer of, of the World Cup. Um, and in order to organize that, they sell billions of dollars worth of broadcasting and sponsorship revenue um, around the world. And the second function of FIFA is the governing body. This is disciplining the football actors around the world um, and making sure the rules are applied the rules that are in the statutes book. And on the third, they are the development organization. So all of this money that uh, they generate from the tournament uh, is dispensed around the world in order to grow um, soccer in, in, in countries um, all across the world. Now, for me, there is conflicts of interest across all three of these functions. Um, and the fact the same person is responsible for all of this uh, the president and some of the power there is, is an issue. Let me give you like a recent example we had. Um, and, and, and FIFA know they're on thin ice here because if this is a legal challenge, they will, they will come under problems. They will come under um, scrutiny and potential problems, which is the player release for the FIFA World Cup qualifiers. We have um, this travel restriction uh, around the world because of the coronavirus that has disrupted the FIFA World Cup qualifiers and I'm going to keep using that word FIFA because you need the ownership here so they are having um, a, a group of matches played around the world in order to have national teams qualify for the FIFA World Cup these players are employees of clubs around the world and we're talking maybe the big issue is in Europe now they have a memorandum of understanding FIFA with European clubs that say that the clubs will allow their players to leave for 10 days for these FIFA qualifying matches. Unfortunately, the pandemic has caused disruption to the calendar. Meant some matches got cancelled and they have to find new um, scheduling opportunities for this. We had one in September and there was a meeting between FIFA um, and, and the leagues and the clubs to figure out a, a solution. Everyone had input and then FIFA unilaterally decided that the South American qualifiers, for example, will take place over 13 days. That's three more days than um, they had agreed with the leagues and the clubs. Well, that's not fair, the leagues and the clubs would say. Equally, in the UK, there, were, there is quarantine for players who go to so-called red list countries, which at the time in September, um, it was every single country in South America. So if you release, um, for example, a Brazilian or Argentine footballer, not only are they going there for 10 or 13, 13 days instead of 10, when they come back, they're likely to miss 10 days, up to three games that would be of, of league play. These are, that is uh, a potentially massive impact on who wins the league, who gets relegated, and the results of football matches, so the integrity of the competition. So they would say, well, we will not release the players. Now that brings us into the second role of FIFA as a disciplinary body. If the clubs don't release the players, the, the risk is that FIFA is going to ban these players from appearing for their clubs for about five days or so. So is that not a conflict in the one hand to say, we want you to be released for our tournament, and if you don't, we, the same people, are going to punish you? To me, that speaks of um, a major conflict of interest here. These, these roles, disciplinary and event organization, should be suspended uh, should be separated as a result. This is just one example. And then finally, the, the second, uh, the final uh, third pillar of FIFA, the development organization. We talked about Africa a few minutes ago, and this is all around the world. Gianni Infantino, when he was elected, he offered four times more money than Sepp Blatter, the previous president, to the 
FIFA's 211 member nations if he was to be elected. Guess what? They voted him in. He, the fact that the president of FIFA is able to make these financial promises using the development money in order to be re-elected over and over again, again, seems to me a structural flaw. Because are people uh, behaving for the right reasons? You could say, yeah, it's rational. I'll vote for the guy who gives me the most money. But is that the best for global football? And is that the best use of FIFA's development money to give every country the same amount? I would argue not. Is that it's not doesn't seem very intelligent. Some countries need more, some countries need less. Um, maybe a, a program-based distribution mechanism would make sense, but that would also affect you when you come to being re-elected. I'm sorry, that was a long answer, but, but this is where we are. Um, what I wanted to ask, sorry, is, is much more about the, the players, right? Because um, it seems like, you know, just in, in the context of the larger sports that although, you know, footballers often are the highest paid, I think I think in terms of their contemporaries and other sports, they, they still have maybe, maybe not, not as not necessarily just the, the, the pay, but, but more, more about the rights and the powers they have. So, for example, you know, I mean, player power in the NBA or the, the NFL or particularly I think Major League Baseball is another one. And my question is always when, when we talk about these things is, is why isn't there more of, a, more of a player power movement in terms of, because it seems like they're always just assumed, like there, there's a given that, you know, like, uh, you know, Pedri is going to play 85 games a calendar and he's 18 and it's fine. That, you know, there's, there doesn't seem to be like, too much um, focus on player well-being and they always just seem like it's a given so what where do you see them sort of fitting into it or is there really anybody like asking their opinion like do they have kind of a seat at the table in this discussion that's it's an interesting point um, but it's very it's very disparate you know we talk about players but there's players and there are players those on those astronomical salaries we talk about are, are, are very few globally yeah. Um, earning these huge contracts. Most players, you know, who, who are playing um, football around the world aren't anywhere nearly as, as um, wealthy as, as, as those that we, we, we see on television. Uh, and that, that doesn't give them much of a seat at the table in that sense. It's a very disparate um, group. You know, you have the FIFA Pro, the Players Union, which, uh, you know, I, I would say is an advocacy group. But again, it doesn't have a seat at the, at, at the table in any meaningful way. There isn't um, a collective bargaining position as such as you mentioned right. you know, in, in, in the US. Um, and the US is a very kind of closed loop system. It's all within that one um, country. So you have a, uh, you know, a collective bargaining situation, players can go on strike, etc. But the structures around football currently mean that there isn't that that voice um although you know you do you do see again but this is to me is very limited to to, to to europe and certain parts of europe for example on, on qatar for example we've seen scandinavian um, nations players from scandinavian countries largely maybe some elsewhere talk about you know um their discomfort about over a world cup being played in qatar and want to raise these issues. Uh, we've had the, the FIF Pro, the Players Union, talking about um, the strain of these additional matches on the health of, of football players. But we've seen them talk about it, but we haven't seen anything concrete. FIFA will, will say, yes, you know, this is something we study, this is something we're aware of, but, but the, the trend to me has been only more, 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 rather than um, anything less. And then talking, you know, talking about maybe caps on the number of games a player can, can participate in, you, you get into a situation where the players also, <laughs> you know, some of those will, 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 uh, will, will be I guess opposed to a, a set cap. For example, you mentioned Pedri. What, what if um, you get into a situation where Pedri is? It won't be this year, given how poor Barcelona are likely to be. You know, uh, finishes his cap in the semi-final of the Champions League, for example, and can't play in the final. 
I don't think there's any players who say, well, you know, I've reached my cap. So there has to be smarter decision making here. Um, and, and I feel like there should be a more detailed process about where the game's going, about what tournaments are going to be held. Something more intelligent. This to me seems like an arms race for power. Yeah. Uh, between between either you know UEFA, FIFA, or big clubs, or whoever it is, the the, cl- the players are, are supposedly actors here, but but in terms of having a say, I wouldn't say they have any meaningful meaningful voice beyond you know um, some of what we've seen on social media or an interview, etc. Yeah, no, it's 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 funny because Constantine and I were talking before uh, having you on, and he he's he's talking me out of calling this episode the the Cold War of football. But now you've mentioned arms race. I think you mentioned zero sum games, and I think if we, if we get like the detente, I think we have the the hat trick of of what we need for the title. But uh, yeah, Constantine was going to ask you the next question. I mean, I wanted to ask the question, but I'm pretty because of the discussion and because of. All the things I have read and researched, um, I'm somewhat dis- disillusioned uh, with, with with everything, and um, I'm still asking myself, and I mean, I'm asking you guys basically where this is all heading, uh, because we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, Cold War might be also a good thing, but also uh, you know, collision course, and um, is is one of the the parties collapsing, which would be the Cold War ending. I, I'm not sure about that, but um, there might also be collision and, and something collapsing. And um, but but then it it leaves. I mean, if let's say the FIFA collapses, then it leaves still a lot of things uh, in shambles. And I'm I'm, I'm just I'm just very uh, as I said disillusioned in a way uh, where this is all heading. And uh, after all, there's n- there might be no one really governing or regulating anything um maybe there's but i don't i'm not sure about that so um in the end that really yeah leaves me a little bit speechless which is which is not happening a lot but this time it does actually yeah you know uh, i think one of you mentioned you know we, we've got we've grown used to this way of football because we've always had it and maybe it is time for a fundamental change and for, for, for me, I, I would like to see the powers of these organizations um, tested. I, I'm, I was no fan of the Super League in the way it was presented by, by these breakaway clubs in Europe. But one of the points they raised was the, the abuse of, of a monopoly by an organization like, say, UEFA in this instance. Uh, I, I think there is some merit in, in some, of, some of this because, one of, for me, you, you, you know, we've talked about FIFA, but if you look at UEFA with the, the, the Champions League and its its role as um, a regulator and the event organizer, for example, financial fair play in, 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 in Europe, which is the rule with, with which teams can must spend only a certain amount of money based on their revenue. If not, they would be investigated and, and sanctioned with the worst offenders banned from European competition. And what we have seen so far is the biggest teams never really sanctioned particularly harshly. Only I've seen teams from Eastern Europe or Turkey, you know, get get the, the hammer thrown at them. And then you think, well, of course, because in the event organizing position, you want your best players and your best teams there because you're selling TV rights and broadcasting. Again, it's the same, it's the same, it's the same issue. Now, why is it that UEFA, for example, must organize the Champions League? Why couldn't, I don't know, somebody else, another organization? You know, I'm just making this up off the top of my head. The ECA, European Club Association, has 200 or so members. Why can't the um, ECA be the organizer of the Champions League and UEFA be the regulator just that splits the powers but but all to say this monopoly uh, position and this issue of abuse of power is a worthy one to be tested by the by the competent judicial bodies in this case it's a European Court of Justice I would love to see the outcome of that and if that might focus the minds make these organizations better at doing their jobs that's probably a good thing and I would say the same goes for FIFA. If FIFA tries to take the game away in a direction that only suits, I guess, its leadership, 
or, or a small group of actors and comes under a legal challenge? Why not? Is it, is it not a time for this stuff to be tested? Yeah, and uh, on an additional point, uh, when it comes to the World Cup and the plans by Infantino to have uh, the biennial World Cup, um, I mean, there's also another player now uh, stepping up or emerging. Um, not not the most, um, not not a player with a white vest or something, but still, it's it's the International uh, Olympic Committee because, of course, the Olympic Games, the Summer Games, would be heavily affected by uh, another World Cup. Uh, which would be likely be played uh, in the same year. Um, and then you m might have other players um, and even political players involved because um, while the, the particular the single disciplines that are performed in, in the, during the Summer Olympic Games might not be as powerful, but the Olympic Games as a whole and the, uh, might be powerful enough to also uh, leverage some power against uh, Infantino's plans. But I think your scenario with uh, maybe even a traditional decision uh, in the end would, I think, more clear cut and it would be uh, probably in the long term better uh, to have decisions like that uh, because right now it's really and when i bring up like thomas bach and and the international olympic committee it's it's still like it would be power play or it would be power player against power player uh, and we <laughs> say, same with uh, the super league same with um, all the other discussions is, is about you know powerful uh, entities against powerful entities um and on a collision course uh, what, what i have now said for uh, for several times so I think, yeah, I think your scenario, if it would be if it would happening, I think that might be the best and the most clear cut scenario where we would have a an, an decision that would be definite. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's a shame when, when the European Union was um, in its infancy, I don't think they took sport seriously enough, um, either as an economic activity or a social activity. It was always a thing at the end. It was never an important part of the discussions. Um, and, you know, well, I find that strange. Obviously, it's grown as an economic activity. Billions of euros are, are invested and are, are generated from this and the jobs, etc. But also the impact, on the social impact. You know, millions of people in, in the continent really care about it. Um, the fact that there wasn't some ground rules before mean almost like it's been a free for all for so long. How do they? How do we? How do we organise this activity in a way that that the people like? And you know, a broader question as well is, you know, as a you know, we were talking about um, players, uh, we we're talking about the, 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 the political actors of FIFA and UEFA, but we don't talk about, I suppose, enough is the public and people um, who is more important you know is that is that match going fan important is it a guy watching tv um how do we set this up in a way that um is the correct or the, well, not if there's one correct way the way that you know everyone um wants to enjoy their sport the, the, you know, it might just be this global free-for-all that you just pay a subscription for at any price you like, and, and that's where football is going. But if we don't want it to be that way, what do we want it to be, and how do you legislate for that? That's another piece of this big question that hasn't really had much interrogation. And I found that so interesting, like, because like we just had this, we just had this sort of pause, and we still have the sort of the pandemic going on, and you would kind of think that there was months without football and wouldn't that have been the perfect time to kind of reflect and ask these questions, right? Because like like you, I, I also, you know, share share this thing that there's just way too much football going on and, you know, um, it's really, really tough to, to 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 cover it all or to follow it all as a fan. And obviously if you're working in it it's 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 even even tougher. But I feel like that that there there really wasn't that time being taken to to use that to ask these kind of you know philosophical questions about about football as much as it was it was it seemed like it was a time taken for um those that are in power to to say well how can we how can we get more or how can we profit more and, and yeah I don't it's worrying isn't it you you, you, know, you paint a picture of a man in a 
you know, Dr. Strangelove in a lair stroking a white cat. Yeah. How, how do I get more? And it's a shame. It's, it's come to this. But again, I, it might be a structural thing. You know, um, if you guys were in charge or if I was in charge, maybe this, the, 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 um, the way it's structured, it kind of maybe forces a human being to behave like this because mm. it, mm-hmm. we see it everywhere and so often you can't say well you know this is a person with bad intentions all the time right maybe the the the, the, the structural basis so like of lack like of checks and balances yeah yeah and it's like you know <laughs> it's like human nature takes its yeah 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 its toll and and maybe we shouldn't leave it to human nature <laughs> and say right we've got to fix this so you're not waiting for um oh, look, he's a nice guy, so he's probably going to do the right thing. It shouldn't be to the whims of whoever's in the seat. This needs to be better. Hmm. Yeah, well, um, I, I don't know how to close uh, this one. Usually we have, a, we have you know, um, a discussion where we come to uh, some kind of conclusion. Uh, I don't know about this time. <laughs> T- Tarek, it's your fault, of course. <laughs> I mean, I guess the conclusion is there's watch this space. There's more to come. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I wanted to ask you uh, on a final note. Is uh, are there um, are there any things you are not, not to reveal anything, but uh, what is, what is your focus uh, in terms of you know reporting and, and and investigation right now? What's what's to come, so to say? Can you tease us a little bit? Well, obviously, this 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 thing will get worse before it gets better. Um, I I think. Um, the there's going to be a, a, you know a bit more of um, this this kind of behind the scenes machinations um, that could really uh, uh, but you know the the, the 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 suit the sleeve is is slightly torn it's slightly frayed anymore and the entire suit could come apart that that's where we're heading potentially uh, and, and we'll be involved in, in reporting that out. And then there are the, the kind of economic tremors. Uh, at the moment, I'm looking at China, which you know five or six years ago was the seen as one of the new motors of, of world football because of obviously the only thing football people seem to care about is money. China is seems to be imploding Chinese football, and we're going to see the repercussions of that. That's something we're looking at, and and all of that plays into this big debate as well. Yeah, um, yeah, the chi- China is an interesting field, um, as you mentioned, like abroad and and at home, uh, in, in both ways, basically, um, pulling out money uh, out of Europe and um, shutting down uh, basically the the old model uh, that was that has was established in the domestic league a um, couple of years ago. Well, well, well. Um, yeah, if people want to find your work, of course, th- that will be published uh, in the New York Times, online New York Times, of course. Um, Tarek, it was really great talking to you. Thank you for your time. Thanks for inviting me, guys. It was a really good discussion. And people can also find you on Twitter, where you will share your work. Uh, you are at Tarek Panja on Twitter. Abel is at BundesPL on Twitter and I'm CC underscore Eckner on Twitter. And if you so want to support us, then please visit patreon.com slash the football pod. And for now, we are out.